Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would speak into our hearts as we open your word. And may we not simply hear your word, but may it draw us to you, the word who became flesh. And may we commit our lives to you. Lord, I pray that through your word, that you would change us, transform us. And only you can do that. And so I pray that you'll help me to just get out of the way, to be a, be a conduit of truth that will come into our hearts and that we would not simply hear it, but we would apply it, that we would obey your word as you speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in the past and we praise you that we can trust you in the future. And Lord, I ask that you would do what I cannot do and that is to change our hearts that will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you go ahead and turn into your Bible to the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 3. This is a well-known passage and one of my favorite passages in Scripture. I am so excited about this message. I was telling someone earlier coming in, it's always good when the pastor believes he's got a word from the Lord. And I believe that I do for you today so that uh, the year 23 can be the best year yet. And I say yet because 24 is going to be even better because in him... The best is always yet to come. Always yet to come. I love this time of the year. I'm so excited about the days to come. I love dreaming. I love setting goals. I know not everybody does that. Not everybody gets as hype as I do about setting goals. Let's go. Let's talk about how we can move into the new year. Uh, If you're not there yet, that's okay. That's okay. But today I'm going to give you, uh, with passion, I believe, but with great practicality, Three questions that we're going to draw from the text that are implied, they're embedded, that we can all ask. And this is the application right here from the start. I want you to take these three questions, write them down, and I want you to reflect on them over the next week. Maybe today is a good day. I always like to find gaps of time to really think about what my goals are for the future. Three questions that we find in Philippians chapter 3. Turn to Philippians 3, verses 7 through 16. Open your word of God, the word of God there before you as we will dive into this passage. Someone said that a goal set is half reached. Um, The great Dolly Parton said that a peacock sitting on his tail feathers is just another turkey. So we got to show up and we got to show out. My dad used to say, um, aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So three questions that we're going to find here. The first one is, what is your ultimate goal in life? Because your ultimate goal, this is true in any organization, it's true here in our church as we exist to lead all generations to love Jesus. Everything we do is aligned to making disciples. And in the same way, your life, whatever your ultimate goal is, is what drives every day and every decision you make. So we're going to ask that question. We're going to hang out on that question. The last two questions are really applications. As we, as we leave, as we go from here, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper before we're done today. On this first Sunday of the new year, first day of the new year, no better way to be reminded of what Christ has done for us. That drives everything that we do. The next two questions, though, are what are you going to leave behind? And what are you going to take with us? What are you going to take with you? How about who are you going to take with you? So we're going to unpack these three questions and dive in because here's what I believe has happened. Now, I may be preaching to the proverbial choir today. But many people have stopped over the past couple of years. I mean, when you consider the great resignation, when you consider all that took place over the past couple of years, maybe you stopped growing spiritually, if you're honest with yourself. Maybe it's been years ago. You've been coasting. Maybe it's been recent. Many people have quit the church. Many people have quit ministries that we were once involved in, once serving, and we've stopped. And my challenge for you today As Stephen has noted, this is just one day on a calendar that's moving forward. This is one comma on a long sentence that is your life. Don't stop at the comma. Don't stop at a comma. Where God puts a comma, don't put a period. Let's keep moving forward. This is one day in a long string of days that is your life. As we enter into a new chapter, your story is still being written. And today my challenge for all of us is to commit, recommit our lives to him. Paul is writing to his, likely his favorite church 
in Philippi. He helped plant this church on his second missionary journey. It's the first church in Europe, by the way. It's about 62 AD, and he's writing to them, and he is, he's blessing them. Kind of what Rodney was saying, what we could go on and on about, say, saying, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. All together, he is saying this to this great church. He loves them so much. And then in chapter 3, he gets to addressing uh, the threat of false teaching. That was in the church, a group of Judaizers essentially claiming that you must um, apply certain portions of the Jewish law in order to be a Christian. Okay, so this newfound thing of grace that's never ever penetrated the heart or mind of the human race. Now he says, okay, all of religion, that is the law, what we've always known and only known, it is now being replaced by this new grace. And he's saying those who teach anything otherwise, who want to go back and he calls them, how about this, in chapter 3, verse 2, they are dogs. I mean, he's not playing. He's coming at them. And then he says, they're the ones who mutilate the flesh. What is this? He's getting to the heart, really, of the argument, the debate. At the heart of the whole Jewish law, in terms of practice, was circumcision, okay, that marked, you know, the, 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 uh, the Jew, the male Jew. And so he's, he's getting to, it's a graphic way of saying uh, that, that a right standing before God is not found in keeping the law. And so, and because circumcision was right at the point of the spear uh, or, or the knife, uh, pun intended, um, he's saying, no, 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 this is not the case. We're gonna move forward and anybody who teaches you otherwise is wrong and off. And he's gonna go into this, he's so passionate about it because it's central, okay, to all that we believe and into life itself, to our salvation. So he lays out, if you know this passage, you can look at it there in verses four through six. We don't have time to look at his, his religious pedigree that he lays out. All of the reasons why he, if anyone wants to argue that you can be justified by keeping the law, he's saying, I'm your guy. Like, here is my pedigree. Here's all the things that I have done. So then what he's doing, he's not bragging. He's setting himself up so that he can make the argument in one of the most theologically rich passages in all of Scripture. And so it starts in verse 7. Look at this together. Here we go. But whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Now, to pause here, he's using this financial kind of accounting language. He does this in Romans. He does it in Galatians, describing the gospel, where Christ's perfect account is on our side of the ledger now, and our sin, our bankruptcy, is showing up on his ledger. He takes our sin upon himself, and he gives us then his perfect, his perfect uh, account or record, okay? Paul is saying that whatever he's achieved, whatever advantages he has, he has had through his education, through his lineage, all of the things, anything that can make him proud or self-reliant, he says are now not considered just as losses, but as liabilities. They're not assets as he thought they were. They're now liabilities. And, and he's, he's setting forth a startling, shocking reevaluation of life altogether. A complete shift, a paradigm shift in his worldview. So he lays out this impeccable resume. He bundles up everything that he has done all of his life. He's bundled it all up in a single, singular loss compared to, as if you know this passage, to knowing Christ, to what he has now received. And so he, he's finding himself here, set free finally from a works-based salvation. Now, for those of us who are believers, you're going, I get this, I understand this, but, but I want to challenge us with this because often as Christians, we, we go back to this old way of life and, and what Paul has figured out and what he has realized is when I'm captured by the grace of God, then whatever was, was what I saw as success has actually made me prideful and judgmental. And, and it's the same with us. What we think is, is the good works that we bring to the table actually make us judgmental, make us look down on others. And, and, and this can happen even in our Christian lives. And friends, I wanna challenge you with this. Even as we hear the word of God, even as you're in the word of God or in your connect group, as you read the word of God, sometimes we think that knowledge is being, is doing. Like that truth has changed my heart. No, that truth has changed your mind. 
But are you living it out? Are you practicing it? It's why some of the most knowledgeable Christians, not all by a long shot, but many can become the most judgmental and unloving people that you know. Because, well, I know this and other people don't know this. And so we have this condemning kind of a spirit. Paul is saying that stuff actually led to pride. The gains from a religious-based self, uh, self-salvation self plan will lead us to pride or it'll go the other way, lead to shame and regret. It is a roller coaster of a life. And many of us continue to live that way. Paul says there is a knowledge, even a doing, that looks like gain, but it's actually loss on the lost side of the ledger. Look at verse 8. What is more, he's going deeper here, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them as garbage that I may gain Christ. Now, we would expect him, wouldn't we, to say, hey, all of that was good. I mean, I was really pursuing God. I sought to do all that he told me to do. But I'm going to leave that behind in order to move to something better. That's not what he's saying. We would expect him to say that. He's not moving from good to better. He's saying, I have surrendered everything. And watch this. He's not surrendering a valued possession. There is no grief in his loss. Because now he sees the process, look at this, the process of assessing a life redefined by grace. This reevaluation leads us with horror to think that the things formerly viewed were benefiting us, watch this, were actually standing in the way of true righteousness that's found in Christ. You see how insidious this is? Well, I'm doing all this for God. Really? See, what happens is a, 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 a works-based salvation under the law, as it were, is actually by blinding us from true righteousness that's found in Christ, which we cannot achieve on our own. So this is the crux, friends. Listen, this is the moment. This is the decision of salvation. Is when you decide, I will not rely on my own works, my own bogus, weak self-righteousness that is actually leading to pride or regret. There's no freedom in that. It's why we, we call coming to Christ, it's described as dying to yourself. Dying to my own self righteousness in order to follow him. And in verse eight, he enters now into a long sentence that goes all the way to the end of verse 11. And and the Greek language, actually details here, help us a little bit. So if you'll geek out with me for just a moment. Um, The word consider, um, and I'm going from the NIV here, uh, count in the ESV, is is a word that really means I've esteemed, I've measured, I've, I've dove deeply into this. I've carefully examined the value of this. And in verse seven, here it is. He moves from the perfect tense, okay, a past tense. I have already counted. I've made a decision in the past that these things are lost to me. And then in verse eight, he shifts to the present to make a key point. Watch this. I now continue. I continue to consider all things lost everything is lost he settled the decision in the past through careful examination and reflection but that's not enough he says i'm going to live in this new view every single day reinforced daily continuous conscious moral choices that i make and and it's this against depending on any self-righteousness of my own that i think i bring to the table that's at the heart of what he's talking about here because it's the heart of being a believer. See, don't miss this. He now sees anything that would, that, would, that would compete against the singular focus of Christ's righteousness covering me. It must be done away with. This is a constant focus in his life. He will now battle against this. He has made the decision, but as a Christian now, our great battle, I could argue this, our great battle is not simply the avoidance of sin. Our great battle as believers is even more the battle against any form of self-righteousness. That's the battle. 
Because you can keep all the laws, as Paul's telling us here. You can be a good moral Christian and still not have the power of God in you bringing about this grace that captures your heart and then guides every relationship and everything you do. And you end the performance track. See, all of this is the result of the encounter with grace. Have you experienced the grace of God? That you have been justified by what Christ has done for you? Have you, by faith, received his perfect life live for you death on the cross for you to take your bankrupt account full of sin hell bound and replaced it with the grace of Christ that is perfect and right true righteousness by faith not your own works Paul is saying here and this is for all of us what I thought was now not not just appealing but appalling is that I would think that I bring some goodness to the table because here's what happens. You know, we say it often. We are more sinful than we've ever known. And some of us are even offended by that. Like, just move on, move on. Okay, and you're more loved than you've ever imagined at the same time because of Christ and what he's done for us. This grace, responding to this grace, it's the only message we have here. It's the grace of God that has changed us and it leads us now, all of this, to the first question. What is your ultimate goal in life? Really? What's your ultimate goal? Okay, well, how would I know? Your first priority in all of life is to know him. To know Christ. You're, you're, this is for every believer. It's not just Paul telling us this. This is for all of us. To know him. You, you, how would I know? You get up every day, Lord. Everything that happens today. Everything that, that comes my way. I want to know you. Even the struggles that I'm facing in my life, the great joys of my life, every encounter I have, I want to know you. And if I struggle through challenges and tribulation, I just want to know you. That's the goal of my life. I wake up today to know you. And for many of us, for me, it, it is, I'm going to start my day in your word because I want to know you. Before I head off to meetings, before I go off to this thing or that, I want to know you more than anything in life. And when I lay my head on the pillow tonight, my goal is clear. I want to know you. And then he says this. Look at verse 9. What does this mean? What are you talking about, Paul? To be found in him. Here we go. Often we, we talk about this. To be found in him. What does this mean? Any moment throughout 23, turn the page on every page, every moment in my life, I am, I'm found in him. What does that mean? I'm covered in his righteousness. That's who I am. This is not a point of salvation, losing salvation. Once in him, we are covered in his righteousness. To be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. In this one verse, you see it? Paul distills the great fundamental doctrine of justification by faith not works in this singular verse you can circle that one come back to it he says this new position i am found in christ totally forgiven fully pleasing to him and then as if to say hey let me clarify this some more look at verse 10 i want to know christ yes okay what, what are you talking about to know the power of his resurrection the participation in his suffering becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead now the word here you might know this gnosis it's intimate communion with christ paul is saying i want to bring clarity here i want my focus to be one person one goal one savior and look look at this he does not lament his losses at all because of the surpassing grace and knowledge of, of knowing Christ. Are you there yet, friends? And on this day, on this day, that does mark a new chapter in our lives. Have you come to a point of salvation? This is the way of salvation. Knowing Christ and pursuing him with everything that you have. He's explaining what is experiential knowledge. Not knowing about Jesus but entering into relationship with him to know him. And he's connecting himself to Christ. Look at this. You see it? Christ's suffering. Notice it's not his suffering, though that'll come. And it often comes in our lives. It's Christ's suffering. 
He's identifying with what Christ has already accomplished for him. Here's the thing. In 23, and today, you may not know what God's doing in your life right now. Well, Lord, we don't know where you're going, but we know what you've done. And that changes everything. So whatever I'm walking through, the suffering of Christ, yes, it seems that to become like Jesus, Paul says, I've got to live a life that looks like the life of Jesus. Listen to this. I would say that resolutions are great. Set goals. I'm doing that. A rule of life is better. A rule of life is a pattern that you will fall, follow. To become like Jesus, to know him and to walk with him, abide in him, means that you're going to live a life that looks like the life of Jesus. It's a cruciform life. So Paul says, I'm going to enter into the, the suffering. I'm going to become like him in his death. His death. I'm going to die to myself every day though, so that I may be resurrected in this new life every day, though I'm already there. I am already, I've already been raised up with Christ, seated with him in the heavenlies. Paul is not claiming his own martyrdom here, though that will come. He's claiming Christ's suffering and death as his own life, so closely connecting himself to it. And then he says, with humility, somehow, in ways I cannot comprehend, I too will be saved. And I too will take on a new body and resurrected life. Out of this frail body and into resurrected life for eternity. See, so many people are, are we get so excited about celebrities that come to faith in Christ and understand that, you know. Bieber, he loves Jesus. This is amazing. Kanye thought he came to Christ. He's getting weird. Don't know what's happening. Um, we, or we, we think, you know, or that guy was in prison and he came to faith in Christ. No, no, we should be like Paul. No, he saved me. Like me. And, and like I've said before, I'm, I know my mind. I know my heart. He saved me. This is shocking and amazing that God would save even me. This is what Paul is saying. Somehow, I'm going to get there because of Christ in ways I can't even comprehend. Friends, do you know Christ in this way? Do you know him? Because the problem, if, if I can just, just challenge us for a moment, the reality is that many of us think we know him and we don't know him. This is the problem. I'd like to think lesser in our church, but, but hear me. In modern Christianity, American Christianity, we think we know him. And we don't know him. Dallas Willard, in his incredible book, The Divine Conspiracy, he writes this. One of the best books I've ever read. He says, this is the thesis of his book. I've quoted this before, but listen to this. Think deeply about this. My hope is to gain a fresh hearing for Jesus. Especially among those who believe they already understand him. In this case, quite frankly... Presumed familiarity has led to unfamiliarity. And unfamiliarity has led to contempt, to, to looking down on him. Because we've already figured him out. And contempt has led to profound ignorance. This is the problem for many of us. I, I think in varying degrees for all of us. You see, many of us think we know him. And so to ask, do you know him, friends? Yes, I know him. Are you saved? Yes, I'm, I'm saved. As if I got the ticket, I'm now sitting in the concourse ready to take off. Like go to heaven someday. Is your life pursuit to know him? To know him every moment, every day. Because what happens is we have such a low view of him, on the one hand, we're bored with him. We've got him figured out. And I think the reason that we do this and I've thought a lot about this. We need to hold two extremes, or I could argue, two coexisting realities at the same time. And they have to do with the nature of Jesus and who he is. See, for some of us, so he's highly exalted. He is God. He's uh, totally other than we are. He is transcendent. He is holy. On the other hand, he, he came in the flesh, in human form. To identify with us. On the one hand, he's not God enough. On the other hand, he's not man enough. And yet we think we figured him out, so we've stopped seeking to know him. And here, here's the thing that I think is, is challenging for us. There's such a gap for some of us. There's such a gap. He's so transcendent. 
He's highly exalted, and he is that. He's holy. And so we think he's so highly exalted, he must look down on us. That is not the case. He identifies with us. He comes, he's, he's 100% God, 100% man. And, and, and one of the, again, best books I've read in a long time is called Gentle and Lowly. If you've not read this book, you need to. Dane Orland. It's subtitled, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. And he gets to this heart, this, this, this thing of, this idea of knowing Christ, who he really is. And, and to get there, he goes to Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, which says, listen to this, this is a word for somebody today. Come to me, all who are weary, tired, labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then in verse 29, it says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I, I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In verse 28, Jesus explicitly tells us who qualifies for fellowship with him. Those who are tired and weary and just beat down. Look, your burden, your burdens, you, you, the weight actually qualifies you to come to him and he to you. All who labor toward holiness and religion under the law come to me and I will set you free because I am kind and I am gentle friends listen to this you need to hear this today our sin actually triggers his love for us God is not repelled by your sin he is drawn to you grace watch this your sin activates his grace it's what he does to know him is to know his his temperament it's to know his personality. It's to know what he does most, who he is at the core. What he is is what he does. He runs towards all of us. The controlling question is this, who is he really? That we would know him and it's to get to the heart of who he is. This is why we're launching a new series next week, all right? Where we're gonna go into the I am statements of Jesus. We're going to get to the heart of who Jesus is. And we're going to look at the I am statements, seven of them, throughout the, the new year. And we're going to be reading scripture together. More on that in just a moment. So how do we stay focused as we land this? How do we remain in him? Look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained the, all this or have already achieved my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has already taken hold of me. See, he's saying, I haven't arrived I haven't gotten to the finish line. This is a comma. I'm moving on. And what happens is we stop. We pause and think, I'm already there. Friends, I challenge you to continue to pursue him. But notice, look at this. This is another sermon altogether. We're becoming who he already has made us to be. He will finish what he started in us. We're fighting a battle that's already been won. Is what we're doing in our Christian lives. Look at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting, watch this, one thing and then he, and he gives us two things. Because there, you can't go one without the other. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is head, I press on toward the goal to the prize, to, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see the two things. See, the first step in goal setting is not to offer this to-do list, but a stop doing list. And that's what Paul is getting to here. So here's the two questions for application. What or who will you leave behind in 23? And the who question, now be careful there, because Jesus didn't just say, hey, just diss people you don't like. He didn't, no, no, no. But we have to have boundaries. Who? Because the better question then, the second one, if one is what will you take with you? I mean, what will you leave behind? The second one is what will you take with you? What or who will you take with you? Friends, what will you leave behind? Unforgiveness. Shame. Uh, uh, broken relationships. Maybe you need to reach out to others. You need to humble yourself. Leave behind a workspace salvation. Leave behind habits that are keeping you from, from uh, entering into the presence of God. Some of it, leave behind your phone. Leave behind 
the things that you put in your mind that create all kinds of anxiety. Stop doing those things and fill them up with who will go with you and habits and patterns that will change your life. Look at verse 15. All of us then, okay, who are mature, I'd like to think I'm talking to mature believers today, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Don't stop at the comma. Keep moving on. But look at what he says here. Hey, if you think differently than what I've been laying out for you, um, you'll, you'll come with the rest of us. God will clear that up for you. You'll get there. You'll get there. Keep coming. Keep coming to him. Don't stop at the comma. Don't stop in 22. Don't go back. The past is beyond, beyond us. It's behind us. How do we do this? Here it is. One day at a time. One day at a time. It's why we are... We are going to be walking through scripture together. We're calling it dwell. And we are going to be in the word, every one of us. You don't have to be a member of the church here to join us. These are passages that we're reading. It's not a read through the Bible. It's books in the Bible that we're reading together that align with our sermon series. And you're going to be able to next week receive um, the information that's going to be out on our website. You'll be able to get a, a bookmark. Um, that we can put in our our Bibles and it's going to have the reading plan for us each day and every one of us are going to be reading and talking about in all of our gatherings, our prayer gatherings, our meetings, our groups when we talk about what God is teaching us through his word. This will change us. So the journey is not to more knowledge. It's not to a position, to a place. It's to a person. And it's through the word of God that the spirit of God draws us to the word made flesh Jesus and friends listen if you don't know Christ today as we enter now into a moment of prayer for each of us and in the coming year and the Lord's Supper together as we close our time I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes right now because if you don't know Christ I want to challenge you with this friends Romans six twenty three. it says for the wages of sin is death don't stop at that comma The wages of our sin is death. Separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you received his grace? Do so now by faith as we've unpacked the gospel at its core today. Because friend, even as this day is simply a comma, So will be tomorrow and the next in a long sentence that is your life. But in Christ, even death itself is a comma. In his return, his coming again to redeem all things is the exclamation point. Do you know him that you could live for him here and now and in eternity? Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking on my sin and for giving me your perfect account, your righteousness. I respond to that with a a life of worship. And for now, as we confess our sin and tell the Lord what what you have heard from him today, I want to spend a moment in prayer as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper now. So you pray, you spend this moment in prayer before him. What will you leave behind? Tell him now. take with you who will you take with you we're not meant to do this alone Lord we leave behind 
our self-righteousness. Captured by your grace, your love without condition, we move forward into this new year and into the rest of our lives covered in the righteousness that you've given to us in Christ. We praise you for it. In your name we pray.